Welcome back from an ad break. We still continue with our grade 12 lesson, Human Resources, right, focusing on salary determination methods and the fringe benefits. So now we are going to be focusing on the fringe benefits. We have covered the salary determination methods. Right, so with the fringe benefits over and above the salary, um, there's going to be a compensation. Well, it's not compulsory though. There's a compensation that is beyond your wages or your salaries. And that compensation is, you are exempted, it's exempted from tax basically. We call that fringe benefits. So now, what are those examples of fringe benefits in the workplace? Right, we're looking at your medical aid fund or your health insurance fund. So these are the examples. Right, so you can, I hope you can see it's under one thing. Then we've got pension fund, we've got provident fund, we've got federal benefits, we've got allowances, but it's car allowance, travel allowance, housing allowance, cell phone allowance, and clothing allowance. All of that, they fall under one thing. I hope you can see it's one thing. So when uh, we say fringe benefits, we can't say number one, it's car allowance. Number two, it's travel allowance. No, they all fall under one thing. Right. And then we've got staff discount, uh, free or low cost meal or canteen facilities, maybe. And in, in, in your work premises, you are allowed to have free coffee, maybe, or bread with butter, maybe during lunch. So these are the examples of the fringe benefits in the workplace. You do find these, they are not compulsory benefits, but these are fringe benefits. We call them fringe benefits. Remember, this is over and above your, your, your salary or your wages. Right, now we're looking at the benefits that are required by the law. Remember fringe benefits, it's not required by law and it's not a compulsory benefit. So we're looking at the benefits that are required by the law, meaning they are compulsory, they are enforceable by the law. We're going to start with this one. We've got what we call unemployment insurance fund, which is your UIF. Right, so what is the meaning of the UIF? The employer and the worker, they each contribute 1%. So 1% from the employer, 1% from the employee. Employers must pay unemployment insurance contributions of 2%. So remember the 2% is made up of what? Of 1% from the employer plus 1% from the employee. And then it gives us what? The 2% of the value of each worker's salary per month. So when you combine the 1% and the other 1%, it makes up 2%. So meaning, let's say I earn a 1,000 rand. So we're going to look at 1% a one, one, 1 of 1,000 rand. It could be maybe a what? My maths is not right, but probably um, 10 rand. So that 10 rand is going to go towards my um, UIF, and um, the employer will also pay 10 rand. So in total, we've got 20 rand that has been contributed towards UIF per month. And then the fund also assists the dependents of a contributing worker who has died. So should the, the, the dependent, rather should the contributing worker die and then the dependents being maybe the kids will, will be assisted uh, from this money, that 2%, uh, it's, it's not that 20 rand obviously, but a total amount contributed. The fund offers short-term financial assistance short-term financial assistance to workers when they become unemployed. So by when you are unemployed, you can go to the Department of Labor and then you claim that money, then you'll be given the money. It's not going to be a lump sum, though. Um, they will discuss it with you to say, how is it that we're going to give you? Hence, they say it's a short-term financial assistance. All right, so now what are the impact of fringe benefits? Remember we said these are the benefits over and above your wages. So the positives of the fringe benefits, who wouldn't want to work at a company that offers fringe benefits? I'm sure everyone would really love to imagine a company that offers uh, a car allowance, that offers a housing allowance, that gives you a medical aid, um, that gives you what? There's canteen facilities, you eat there and all of that. So what are the positives of that? Or the advantages of that it improves productivity resulting in higher profitability because you feel that you are well taken care of you feel at ease 
Uh, attractive fringe benefit uh, packages may result in higher employee retention and reduces employee turnover, meaning we are able to retain more employees. So um, it's rare to find uh, employees um, resigning and they leaving our our business due to uh, due to those um, the the attractive fringe benefit packages that we are offering them. So we are retaining a larger amount of employees. It attracts, um, attracts qualified, skilled, or experienced employees who may positively contribute towards the business goals or objectives. All right, we move on to the negatives. Now, what are the negatives? In as much as the fringe benefits are good, but still there are negative, um, bene not negative benefits, negatives of the fringe benefits. All right, so it says here businesses who cannot offer fringe benefits fail to attract skilled workers remember I said fringe benefits are not compulsory so you can't say all the businesses have to offer the fringe benefits it's not every business that offers them however it would be lovely for all businesses to offer so if you were to be employed and have to choose between a business that offers and a business that does not offer definitely you would go for the one that um, offers business um, that offers the fringe benefits so if that's the case, you had to choose and then the business does not offer and then they are failing to attract the skilled workers. Right. It can create conflict or lead to con corruption if the benefits are allocated and fail. What does that mean? You are giving worker A maybe um, a car allowance, but worker B does not get a car allowance. So that leads to what? It creates conflict in the workplace. Um, yeah, it creates conflict in the workplace. It decreases business profits as incentive package or remuneration costs are higher. Obviously, there is money, especially we're looking at now if the employer has to contribute towards that. So it is costly. So it requires the business to be to be financially um, stable or financially able in order for them to continue or to be um, to be to continue with um, these benefits. So it can be costly to do that. All right, we're moving right along now. We're going to be looking at now the impact of legislation, right? Like I said, we're focusing on the four legislations, right? The Labor Relations Act, right, with regards to now um, the impact of, of the recent legislation with regards to human resources now. It promotes the resolutions of labor disputes that we know, right, Labor Relations Act, it promotes the resolutions of labor disputes, like with the disputes, we're talking about the conflicts, we're talking about disagreements. So Labor Relations Act comes into place. We are able to look at the act and say it will guide us to say how to resolve it, these uh, disputes. It protects the rights of employees and the employers as outlined in the Constitution, in as much as the employers have got rights, also employees and vice versa. It provides for unresolved disputes to be referred to the labor courts and the labor appeal courts. Now, remember, if you are not happy with what the labor court is saying with regards to um, a resolution, and then if you're not happy, then you can appeal and go to the labor appeal courts. Well, it starts with the CCMA. If you're not happy with the CCMA, you take it to a labor courts. From the labor courts, you go to the labor appeal court. But what provides this? It's the Labor Relations Act. It, it guides us with regards to that. Now we move on to the other impact, which is Employment Equity Act. What is Employment Equity Act? It says equal pay for what? For work of equal value. So if you're doing the same thing, we need to be paid equally. It ensures that affirmative action as a policy promotes diversity in the workplace. Very important that when we are employing, we're not only focusing on the same uh, gender, but we are uh, empowering both genders or all the genders, right? The human resource manager must promote and provide equal opportunities in the workplace, right? It will take us back to this equal opportunities regardless of the gender, right? We're looking at the third legislation being the Skills Development Act. What are the implications of Skills Development Act for this, for human resource management? Employers and employees, they contribute 1% of their salary or salary bill to the Skills Development Levy. 
ensuring training in the workplace is formalized and structured, appoint a full-time or part-time consultant as a skill development facilitator. Remember, you have to take, you are required by the legislation to take the employees for skills development. They have to be a skilled so that it can maximize or increase on productivity. So we're, as we're doing that, and then we need to appoint a full-time consultant as the skills development facilitator. Lastly, we're looking at the Basic Conditions of Employment Act. It says here, workers must receive a double if they work during the public holidays. And remember, this should also be by agreement. They have, we have to agree. Both the employer and the employee must agree so that they can receive their double if they work during public holidays. Workers can take up to six weeks paid sick leave during a 36-month cycle. So it is very important as the human resource manager that you familiarize yourself with all these legislation because you have to comply by the legislation because failure to do so, there are penalties. All right, we've come to the end of our lesson, but to wrap up, we're going to do the last point. Workers should only work nine hours per day in a five work, work week. Remember, we've got 45 hours per week. So 45 hours per week, it can either be nine hours in a five work week, uh, five day work week, or it can also be eight hours in what? In six days. Eight hours in six days, which will now give us 45 hours. So we're using the legislation as a guide as when you are a, a human resource manager. Right, we've come to the end of our lesson. I hope you've learned. I hope you've enjoyed the lesson because I've enjoyed the lesson. So from me, Ms. Maboe, I'll see you next time. Goodbye.